welcome back to Wake Up, Shift is Happening. I am Deborah Ariel Peach, and sitting next to me is the charming and ever so amazing Frank Ferrante. And before we get into really what you're here to talk about, we're, we've had a little change of plans. In fact, um, this is live television, and so since uh, the first guest, Josh and Rebecca Tickell, that were going to come on the show, uh, Josh is actually very ill and has pushed himself all week and called about 45 minutes ago and said, I really can't do this. And so I are my, huddled up with my team and I was like, okay, well, and you got here and early and I thought, and I tuned in. And um, the guidance that I got was to actually talk and to, uh, at the, really what was in the highest divine good was for me to bring forth some information. So before I go into that information, I would like to acknowledge you and introduce you even more. Um, we met about two years ago this week mm. at the Topanga Film Festival. And it was uh, at your, I think it was one of your, the debut screenings of the film, mm -hmm. May I Be Frank. And it was it is incredibly powerful and life transformative and transforming. And so here you are now. And thank you for being here. You're welcome. Uh, a lot of life has occurred for you. And continues to do so. <laughs> day to day. Fortunately, you know, <laughs> I like to start my day on the right side of the grass. It's a, there's so, a lot of promise that way. You, exactly, exactly. So we're going to get into your whole story and what brought you into this transformational experience that is really revealing um, uh, through May I Be Frank. And then we're going to talk further about that. The guidance I got, though, is to actually start talking about some of the different things that um, I have been given information on. And, you know, you know that I uh, am, I kind of traverse between being multidimensional, you know, communicating in this dimension as well as, tra as traverse with communicating with non-physical beings of light and energy and get very detailed information for people and also as well as what's going on in the, on the planet, like in the macrocosm. So the guidance I got uh, half an hour, 45 minutes ago, was to actually talk about some of these things that I only just mentioned a little bit about in the first show that I did, which was last week, and it was with uh, people like Philip Collins and Foster and Kimberly Gamble and Mary Liz Murphy. So we're circling back after we've laid the foundation. And what I'd like to uh, start with is some of the things that I mentioned in that show I referred to this time on the planet. Now, the show, the title of the show today is Humanity is a Choice Point. And how do we go from breakdown to breakthrough? And so here we are as a, on the planet, in the macrocosm of the planet, we are pretty much in breakdown in a lot of areas, most areas in, um, in our lives as far as and the systems. The banking system, if you're following any of the behind the scenes that are now is finally coming out to the um, mainstream media. You know, they're starting to cover the LIBOR situation and the uh, oil industry. And Josh Tickell, who was going to be here, has just done a, a film called The Big Fix, which is uh, it talks about the um, uh, Gulf oil spill and that situation. And... The other things that um, really have not been working and serving the betterment of humankind and for the whole. And so I refer to this time, uh, so the guides that I work with, I will refer to many of them are Ascended Masters and the Angelic Realm. And I say work with because it, that's basically what it is. It's a strategic alliance that um, is telepathic communication. I get details. And Cobra I had on the show last week was somebody that I align very much with the information that he's bringing forth, which is why he came on in um, the show and we've had several conversations. So where are we right now? 
So here we are, mid-2012, we're moving into the end of the year for 2012, and I refer to this time that we've been experiencing, especially in the last 10 years, 11 years since 9-11, as the dissension reality as well as the deception reality. And I say this because the guidance that I have received is that in 2001, what was meant to occur in the game plan in the big blueprint was for us to really start an ascension journey where there was 12 timelines that were going to come together 12 dna strands activating 12 zodiac signs many things that were meant to um, in our awakening increasing in the vibration on the planet as well as our physical um, crystalline grid structure that's within our physical vessels to activate and to become higher vibration and much more love. And that by this time we were meant to be creating, many of us be creating modern day miracles. And we are not on that timeline. And so how do we create, how did, how did we get here? And the only reason I'm saying this is so we have some understanding and awareness of how we got here so that we can move past the challenges and the issues that have gotten us here, or that we have, um, yeah, that have gotten us here, and uh, move into the timeline that exists that is, I believe, much more filled with love and abundance and the joy that we're meant to really be experiencing. And so, um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I'd like to just show a clip of. So there's some things that I have been uh, told by my guides that uh, have really affected us right now, not only because the powers that be that have had um, rather uh, controlling uh, agenda um, for money and for all sorts of um, different things, natural resources, etc., but also there has been some um, challenging um, aspects that have created some uh, challenges with our physical vessel, especially our brain. And so one of the things is um, when we, the chemicals, uh, as far as like chemtrails and the different things that in the chemicals that are in our food and whatnot, actually are affecting our brain chemistry. And so um, if we could roll, I just want to show a couple of clips and then we're going to um, talk about this a little bit more. So right now, the, the clip that I'd like to show is about the uh, amygdala. And because we, since 9-11, there's been so much fear and survival that has been pumped out through the media and through the banking, that there's not enough money, that there's, you know, we, this war on terrorism, etc., with that fear and survival information that we are now uh, basically taking in, it's something that's in our brain chemistry that creates that reality then as well. And it keeps us in the fight or flight. Okay, so if we can roll that clip, um, this is just a one minute, really quick little animated clip that give some information about the fight or flight perspective. And this is also ties into your experience, Frank, um, of the transformation that you've, you've experienced, well, prior to the, the May I Be Frank experience. The amygdala is a pair of small organs in the brain, each about the size of an almond. The amygdala acts like a thermostat, regulating, among other things, our normal baseline anxiety level. As anxiety levels rise in response to stressors such as bereavement, work stress, or money worries, for example, the amygdala's needle is pushed up to the high anxiety zone. Under normal circumstances, this needle returns to normal after the event. But when the stress or anxiety you experience is relentless, the needle gets stuck at the high anxiety position. It becomes instinctual. The subconscious mind, which controls all the automatic bodily systems, thinks that this new anxiety level is appropriate and normal but you know consciously that it is not. It is as if the hard drive of your mind has been reprogrammed with new anxious software. With this new anxiety level come sensations and symptoms of anxiety disorder and maybe panic attacks, phobias, and disturbing thoughts. So in order to reverse these changes, you have to reset the needle of your amygdala back to the normal position. 
So you start to get an idea of fear and survival. And we have a mass consciousness on the planet that is very, uh, very much in fear and survival. How do we get out of this? How We're at choice point. Humanity is a choice point. So how do we shift out of this? Well, the next clip that I'd like to share is um, with Bruce Lipton. Now, Bruce, I actually know from back in the uh, day when I was producing a radio show called The Aware Show, and that was like back in early 2000, 2000, 2001. And Bruce is a cellular biologist, and um, he was kind of almost an atheist uh, until he had kind of an awakening. And through cellular biology came into the awareness that everything is connected and that we create our reality. So this is a clip that he did as an interview and um, there's, we're only, I'm just going to have a portion of it um, shown. The concept of a material universe ruled the world. And in 1925, physicists finally had to accept the reality that it's not a universe based on matter. It's actually a universe based on energy because the atoms are not made out of matter. They're made out of energy. So everything is made out of energy. So there you are in one day saying this is a material mechanical universe and the body is a machine. It's got chemistry in it. And then according to physics the next day, it said, well, that's an illusion. The body is actually energy and it's influenced by energy. And yet... The physicists, going from Newtonian physics to quantum physics, it wasn't an easy transition. I mean, if you made your whole career teaching a, of a material universe and one day wake up and say, you know, everything I taught for all those years, let's just forget that and start again, it wasn't easy. So there was a, it was a transition phase where the old thinking had to evolve, you know, leave the system and the new thinking coming in. Well, Today's new biology is, is exactly the same, but it has a more profound difference for us in one sense because the, the old physics took us like from a, uh, uh, you know, a crank telephone to a cell phone or, or, or from a steam engine to a rocket ship engine. Mm -hmm. That was the difference between Newtonian physics and quantum physics. And in biology, the new biology is going to take us from a world today uh, of crisis and ill health and, uh, and a failing, a failing uh, environment and world and take us to another level uh, of masterful control where we, in our consciousness and our experiences of life, will actually have power over our own lives and not be the victims that we were programmed to be. So to me, when people understand the nature of this and recognize how their perceptions about life, which, which we'll talk about, about beliefs about life, when they change, it actually has a biological connection through the energy field, through quantum physics, and through a new thing called epigenetic control. Remember, genetic control controlled by genes. Epigenetic control is the new field of science. As a matter of fact, just within the last year or so, it's finally breaking into the public because it's been at the leading edge of science for about 20 years. But that science takes a long time before it can ultimately get to the public or mass attention. So they're just bringing it to the world, to the mass world, epigenetic control. And epi means, uh, that's a prefix that means above. So when you say the word epidermis uh, in biology, the, the skin, the epidermis, means the layer above the dermis. So epi means above. And you say epigenetic control, then that translates as control above the genes and that is like the difference between either controlled by the genes or your control is above the genes and and when you're controlled by the genes you're a victim of your genes when you're controlled by a, something above your genes and that controls your genes and it turns out the mind is what's above the genes and it's the mind that controls the genes and when people in the world can own this not as well that's a neat idea but as a fact then it says, well, if you want to change your life and you want to express different characters or traits, then it's incumbent upon you to know that your mind is involved with actually creating that ability, that behavior, that genetic expression that allows you to control what you want in your life. So we go from victim to master in this new biology. Here we are. Humanity is that choice point. And this is an individual inside job, which is what you are, have been um, expressing for the last couple of years, as well as the macrocosm, the consciousness mm -hmm. of the collective 
uh, unified field. And so what I'm here to do is support people and having the awareness of what it takes. And I say to people, waking up is not for the mamsy pamsy. And this is some of the things that we're going to share and show that you experienced in the uh, making of, may I be frank, and your transformation. It can be hard. Hard as heck, right? Some of it is some of it is hard, and and most of it is just different. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, it's and it, it also requires a willingness. It, it, it's 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 not something. There's no magic bullet. Right. Exactly. Okay. So let's just you know what? Let's just I'm gonna we'll come back to the Bruce Lipton stuff and all of that later. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about how all this really started because. In order for us to change and shift where we are as a collective consciousness, as humanity, it takes the kind of fortitude, the courage, the commitment, the willingness that you have experienced. And um, it took uh, you stepping in and saying yes, basically. So let's go back to that. For people that haven't seen May I Be Frank, and we're going to show some clips of the, of the film. If we can find if we those. Can find, exactly. <laughs> um, so this all started when you were at a restaurant, correct? Yes. I, I just, I just, may I just go back to something you said Absolutely. earlier, you mind? If, uh, talking about the planetary shifts and all that. Yeah. And um, uh, the breakdown, of this, all these systems that are breaking down. That whole um, notion that too big to fail, which is absurd because it's actually too big to sustain. And and I think when I look at it from a, 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 meta, a, a metaphorical uh, standpoint, when you think of a wounded animal, mm -hmm. that's when they're most dangerous. And right. And the way the way I perceive collectively what's going on is that these systems. And people are invested in these systems. Absolutely. And, and very, very life. much invested in these systems, irrespective of whether or not they're, it's in their best interest to do so. Absolutely. Because if you look at vote, people's voting patterns, they're amazingly, it's, it's amazing to see people's voting patterns because they just di vote directly against their best interest. Right. And, and, um, and so... When these when the animal's wounded, mm -hmm. it, it becomes more threat more threatened and yeah. more threatening. Yeah. And you look at um, um, these uh, people protesting, and right right now people people worry people talk about the threat of China, and I think you know I, I think that's silly because we're their best customer. They're mm -hmm. not going to do anything to hurt us. Mm -mm. What we have to worry about are the banks and the police. Mm -hmm. you know, as is. And and uh, and law enforcement, and that, in the sense that, you know, in in terms of homeland security and, and all right. of that, because it promotes that fight or flight thing. Absolutely. And you you think um, the, the 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 terrible thing that happened in Aurora. You would think that people would be up in arms that that you can actually go somewhere and buy a gas powered gun rifle that will shoot a hundred rounds of ammunition right. like that. And instead, what happened is that California has sold more, double the amount of guns that it sold a few years ago. Yeah. Um, why? Right. Right. <laughs> you know, There's what was a coming? Lot of stuff you know, going is on. it the? Exactly. Are we still worried about the British? Right. No, and I think you know we're going. We're we're you're you're taking that conversation down a road where. Um, it, we're, especially here in America, in the United States, we're really at a pivotal point and people really do need to wake up and to be um, aware of what's going on and this whole ha homeland security situation and the things that have been fed to us through the media that are keeping this um, fear and survival reality in place, um, we need to transcend it and really wake up to what's going on. Well, th there are certain practices that that propel a species to thrive mm -hmm. and to, to not just to, to survive and thrive right because right. we thrive right that's like you know a, a line doesn't necessarily thrive it, you know it just lives survives but we have the capacity to thrive as an observer it's like if somebody landed from another planet and looked right. at us right <laughs> yeah they would say that we are working against our own survival absolutely 
when we have when we have um, we have a, we have systems in place that will prevent improvement. Yes. For example, I mean, just like take for example the the, the pharmaceutical companies. Yep. All right. The, and by the way, and I, I, I'm not here to down the pharmaceutical companies. However, yeah, it's easy to do that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm staying away from that for a reason, and I'll, we can get into that later. It's not designed to cure anything. No. It is not designed to cure anything, and um, um, and it's not in their best interest. Because I believe right now, if by some if we were stroke struck with this insight of how to if and we could cure cancer and this thing will cure cancer, right. we would not make it to the parking lot alive. Right. And that is a testament to something an internal dysfunction that that is really it's, it's we don't have to worry about our survival because we won't and, and, well, and, and the one thing I wanted to mention is that is that one of the things one of the the issues I have with the left or at least part of the left is that we know what the problems are and sometimes it's really easy in discourse to get mired the kids to get stuck in the mire of the problem mm -hmm. we know what the problems are so now, and it's important to look at it, and now it's, and then, and then, what is it that we can do about it? I'm not saying I even know, mm -hmm. but collectively, that's what starts to happen. There, right. Because I believe that collectively on the planet, we have the genius that will take care of the Texas-sized island of plastic in the Pacific. We have the genius that will resolve the problem in Japan. Yeah. We have the genius that will resolve starvation in, in, in Africa throughout the world. We have that collective genius. What we don't have is the ability to 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 coalesce yes. as a group of people so that we just so, so we have these disparate groups you know the gays are over here and and you know the the arms people over I mean everybody's like separate and and um, and that's also you know and that's also promoted there's no this this it's really difficult to now to to collectively unionize for example okay so let's touch upon that let's touch upon that <laughs> So, last week, my first show, I had as part of my guests were the Foster, Foster and Cam, um, Kimberly Gamble, who, um, and the reason that I asked them to be a part of it was because of the foundation with Thrive, that they have set um, such a precedence, such a grounded um, dis uh, way of bringing forth the information of, there's really been a shadow government throughout the planet, and there's been a hidden agenda that has not been for the people. And so I know I'm not here and I'm not interested in um, getting into all the conspiracy theory stuff um, other than that, that that is exactly why what you just said, we're working, um, If I think that if um, people really woke up and awakened to um, co-creating together and coming back together and standing, not from a place of anger or not from a place of resentment or judgment, but really standing in our power um, for the things that we stand for. Um, and it's even beyond freedom and democracy. It's, it's really standing for free will. And that was one of the things we talked about last week too that I was gonna bring up again today is that because there's been such a contraction and a controlled um, information through the media and in, in order for us to hold together this reality of this dissension reality that I refer to we haven't even been given the, the choices homeland security whatever you want to refer to them as we haven't even been given the free will choice to choose from absolutely any possibility we were given a choice from uh, it's basically a multiple choice you know to remember, remember doing a multiple choice test right. in school. Well, you, it's multiple choice free will. You, you, right now we have the choice of like 36 flavors at Baskin Robbins. You can have like 14 different bagel flavors. Choices, of, choices galore. Go to the Gap. 18 different kinds of genes. But in terms of really substantial choice, right? It's it's extremely limited. limited. It's and extremely for, and, limited, and it's been held back for a reason. And and it's actually, yeah, I don't. The agenda is not so hidden, as far as I'm concerned. Not anymore. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's never really been. If you can just look at it, I mean, 1913 when they you know when they 
the, you know, the Fed started and, and all of that. And, and the, the, the other thing is that the scarcity mentality, there's, there's a validity to that. And I'll tell you, and the reason is because there isn't enough money if you look at the banking paradigm. When you think of interest payments, the there, there's no way. If everybody wanted to pay back everything right now, there wouldn't be enough money to pay everything back. Well, and that's, and that's where inflation comes from. They print more money, devalues the thing, and, and creates more debt. This, the, our economy is based on debt. Right, it is. And that's what's got to change. If you, if, um, if you know, if you really go down that rabbit hole and you really, exactly what you're talking about, get into the fiat system that was set up to manipulate that it's all debt-based rather than um, asset-based, that is why we're in this contracted situation globally that we are. Which and Interestingly enough, if mm -hmm. you look at some religious practices, um, uh, interest was a sin. Right. And oh, okay. It's, there were some religious practices where, where, um, where, where interest was actually not, was condemned by a particular certain religious sects. Where did they get that insight? There was no Rothschilds then. There was no Bank of America then. Right. There was an insight. This stuff, everything that we, I, I think that like, what's really fascinating to me is everything that's in the new age and new thought is not new. None of this is new. It's, a, it's just a reawakening to, to principles. And, and if you look at first century and second yes. century Christianity, they would fit right. They, they would be sitting here. People, the people that were genuinely heartly from their heart practicing first and second century Christianity, would would be in complete alignment with everything we're talking about exactly. in new thought. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Frank. Let's. We're going to back up. <laughs> okay. Oh no, and we're going to we're going to take we're going to keep going. But what um, we're going to do is show your trailer. Okay. Because I really would like people to see the before and after. Um, and why, when I say, you know, you've had, you, you've displayed transformation. So, um, and, and I say to people, you know, like I said already, it's waking up, is, it's not for the mamsy pamsy. So, um, let's go ahead and roll the trailer. Well, I found drugs. I thought this was a secret they were keeping from me. I really did. I thought, holy shit, this is how you get through life. This is how you do it. And I realized I started to feel the way I thought I was supposed to feel. I was supposed to feel like John Wayne, but I didn't. I felt like Gumby. Frank's a heavy set Italian from Brooklyn, New York, sort of obnoxious. Are you talking to me? But, you know, he's got a really endearing way of being. Frank's one of those guys, he walks in and before he knows anyone in the room, he's already like commenting about the space or making a joke. <laughs> The whole thing started off when Frank came in, Cafe Gratitude, a mostly raw food restaurant, and we have a question of the day. And the question of the day was, what do you want to do before you die? And Frank said, I want to fall in love one more time. I don't think anyone will love me with this body that I'm wearing because I don't love myself. I'm taking a slew of other medications. In the morning, I practically take a fistful of pills that, you know, I don't really even know what they're doing. And I feel really terrible about it, quite frankly. This propelled me into action, and I just was like, you want to do an experiment? How about you come in here, and you eat this food, you allow us to be your transformational cheerleaders so that you can shed whatever you're carrying, the shame, the weight, the discontent, and really love yourself so that someone else can love you. These have got to go. That's not mine, that was left to me. Liar. Fried chicken. We know what oh, Frankie's yeah. been sneaking. That's actually growing vegetables on that. <laughs> I haven't eaten any of that crap. Look at that breakfast. This looks like it should be mowed. It actually was mowed, and then it turned into that. Oh, God, he's doing it champ style. <laughs> Every muscle in my body is about to split in half right now. <laughs> We can heal the self-diminishing aspect of Frank. That's going to change a lot of aspects of his life. It's nice to meet you. 
No, I'm not from outer space. Repeat after me. Yes, sir. I, Frank. I, Frank. Do love me. Do love, do love me. I am perfect health. Radiant, radiant, radiant beauty. It feels terrible. This is what you want. All right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. I keep thinking every day, well, you know, if something will happen today to create a shift. Somewhere in me, I believe that things are going to change. What would love do now? It's just that I don't see how. What would love do now? You know, my experience is that I'm still caught up in my anger towards my daughter and Mia. For letting this whole thing happen, that, you know, to take away, to take away my ability to take care of my kids. Until you see Lisa face to face and deal with her anger, she's angry because of what she saw me going through. Because see, you didn't see that. Did anybody ever say to her this was not right what we did? No. They haven't got the fucking balls. Fucking right. As rageful and self-loathing as I feel right now, I might as well have just I still be a fucking dope fiend. But I don't think that the pain you cause other people can be separated from the pain that you incur on yourself. I wanna be afraid. I'm sorry I hurt a lot of people. I really, I mean, I'm really sorry. Shyla said, you know, your life will change. It happens to some people. All of that has helped me come back to the person I was supposed to be in the first place. I want to be a friend. I caught a glimpse of my foreskin this morning. <laughs> I did! I, no, well, I kind of took my stomach in, but I saw a glimpse. I mean, we're on our way there, boys! <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on our way there, boys. Oh. <laughs> so, now for those of you that have not seen the May I Be Frank, now you know why uh, Frank is here and why we're talking about choices and why we're talking about transformation and that... Um, Waking up in transformation is not necessarily for the mamsy pamsy. It can be really challenging. Congratulations. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I feel very, very fortunate. You know, most people that I know that have gone through the things that I've gone through with drugs and alcohol and narcotics and and all of that, um, you know, the, the, a lot of people aren't here. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, I, uh, I, I often. Uh, when I, I when I go to like a twelve step meeting and people talk about, I went to my high school reunion and I'm thinking, God, you know, my high school didn't they didn't even give it a proper name? It was called Eastern District High School. <laughs> I mean, like they must have ran out of presidents or, or inventors or something. But I thought oh, my high school really my high school reunion would be an institution somewhere. <laughs> I mean, really, because like only and most you know half of them would be on one side of the glass and the other half would be on the other side. Or a morgue. Or a morgue. Or a morgue. Oh, yeah. So, I'm very, very lucky. And you're right, it's not for, it's not, excuse me, it's not for the faint of heart. Yeah. Um, I, um, I really notice, one of the things I notice is that, about people, is that people may hate their lives, but they hate change even more. Right, yeah. And it's a very uncomfortable place to be. Right. It's a very, very difficult and challenging place to be. However, if you want something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. Or if you want to get back to where you were before and, you know, Well, actually, and have... you don't want to get back there because you, well, this is, because, because wherever back there was, you got here. Right. from that place yeah good point so so it's really it's and and that's you know, another another form of thinking that that people have this, this notion every generation has this notion that there was once the good old days right and it's a very very subjective view of of history mm -hmm. 
It really depends on who you are and what you had at the time. So people could say, well, the 50s and 40s and 50s were a simpler time if you were a white middle class person. Right. If you right. were a black person, you couldn't go to, to the 5 and 10 and get a cup of coffee. Right. So it really depends on who you were at, at who you were and at the time. And this goes all the way back to Socrates. Every generation that talked about how the one before. I figured the only one that couldn't make that claim would be Lucy, the, the skeleton they found in Africa that's 250,000 years old. <laughs> Her contemporaries in Africa could not have said that because there was nobody before that. Right. right? Wow. So, so it's, it's really about to be getting into the present. How things used to be are no longer how they are. Absolutely. And Absolutely. it's sort of like when people talk about their childhood, you know, that they had, yes, those issues may have been imposed upon you at one point. Now they're your issues. What are you going to do about them? Right. You know. So let's, let's go back. To the way, let's get into the <laughs> way back machine. <laughs> the way back machine. How did this all start for you? You were sitting in a restaurant because you obviously you made a choice. You were you basically were at choice point, and it had to do with love. Love is the answer, and everything else is a question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that sounds really hippy dippy, and I really don't care. Um, I don't think it sounds hippy dippy. Uh, what happened was that I was in a where my where I was in my life at that time. I was nearly three hundred pounds. I was pre diabetic. Uh, I was being treated. I had was undergoing chemotherapy. Uh, so I had hepatitis C, and I was taking these really, really uh, powerful uh, drugs that just like basically kill everything. It's, chemo basically. It's funny how, in a way, m the practice of medicine hasn't changed from the high Middle Ages. In the high Middle Ages, they they discovered a cure for syphilis. It was mercury. <laughs> it in fact cured syphilis. It also killed you in a right. week. And chemo has a, really reminds me of that kind of thing. Anyway, I was really sick. Uh, I was very just depressed, very lonely. And uh, I was on my way to rent some Italian films to bring to my cousin Michelangelo, who was ill at the time. I was going to go to San Diego. And, and I, went to, I was living in San Francisco, and there's this um, um, video store that specializes in foreign titles. Because I'm a snob. They have to be, like... So, has to be subtitled. Can't, <laughs> can't do the dub thing, right? So, so uh, please give a reasonable. Oh, <laughs> so, so, uh, so, so actually, so I started out by really wanting to do something kind for my cousin. You know, it was like oh, I'm going to do something kind for my cousin. But when in retrospect, that's how it started. And I went to this part of town that I normally didn't go to uh, to get these videos, and they saw a sign saying "Cafe Gratitude." And in the 12-step world, gratitude is a central virtue. Mm. Uh, one of the things that we say, for example, is a grateful heart will not drink, mm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to take that a step f further, a grateful heart is less likely, less likely to create wreckage in people's lives right. either. So I thought somebody in the 12-step world was being cute. Ah, and, interesting. And it was a, a dark and dreary February evening. And it was the kind of evening you would have expected Sydney Green Street and Humphrey Bogart to be walking behind you. Right. It was like foggy and and the ground had a layer of mist on it. And so I walk into this into this cafe uh, and and there was hardly anyone in there. And as I opened the door, I met with this fanfare. Mm. Hi, welcome. Glad you're here. Come on in. Glad you're here. And hey, you know, so, I mean, it was like 18 years worth of greetings in like two seconds. <laughs> And prior to that time, I was so lonely, I was ringing my, my own doorbell to hear what a visitor might sound like. <laughs> so I walk over to Ryland, who was one of the filmmakers, and I said, Hey, man, I had to have a cup of coffee in Cafe Gratitude because I thought somebody here must be in recovery. <laughs> and he looked at me and smiled and said, Well, we're all recovering from something, aren't we? Oh, funny. And I thought... I immediately knew he was not in the 12-step world and just figured he might have smoked a joint before going to work. <laughs> and uh, and so I started going there because when I was that fat, I never felt seen. Mm. I felt like people were just looking at my exterior and couldn't see past mm -hmm. it. And the very thing I wanted, I've actually prevented by mm -hmm. doing that. 
And so I kept going, and one day, uh, they have one of the things they do in Cafe Gratitude is they ask a question of the day, and the function of that is to promote meaningful dialogue among the people in, on the, in the table. And for example, well, wait one second. So Cafe Gratitude, I think, um, in some of the restaurants, there's like community tables, right? Yes. Where you share. Yes. You'll go in by yourself, and you like can share a meal at a community table. Yes. Type of thing, right? Yes. Okay. If you if you choose. If to. you choose. Exactly. Or it's the only place to sit. Right. <laughs> in which case, you still have a choice, but. Right. Um, and so. I started going there, and uh, and as I said, one of the questions might be, "What are you grateful for?" Or, what moves you in your life? That with the day, that particular day, uh, after I had been going there for a while, because I started feeling comfortable in that atmosphere. Right. The question of the day was, "What's something you want to do before you die?" And I said, "Before I die, I before I die, I I want to fall in love one more time." But I don't think it's going to happen, given the way I look and the way I feel. Mm -hmm. And this moved him, which I didn't mm -hmm. know at the time. And a few days later, I'm back in the restaurant, and Rylan comes up, he comes and sits down and says, Hey, Frankie, you know that movie Supersize Me? I said, Yeah, well, that's where that movie, that young, healthy guy eats himself sick through super si eating uh, fast food for a month. Mm -hmm. He says, Yeah. He says, Well, we, want, we have an idea for a film that's the opposite of that. We want to take a guy who's not well, which was a, quite a generous assessment for my condition at the time. Right. But he says, one thing, I was not well and feed him raw food for X amount of time and go to holistic health practitioners and and uh, do colonics, another thing I didn't know anything about. Right. And um, and we want you to be the guy. Wow. I said, all right. I, you know, and I didn't think anything of it. Now, mm -hmm. the, the magic of this is that we didn't have a camera. I had the most film experience because I had seen the most movies. <laughs> And, I love that. Uh, and, uh, and somehow, piece by piece, things came together. We got a camera that was perfect for the job because somebody was so, we, there was somebody in their community that was a professional filmmaker, and there was the latest and the greatest that just came out, and what he had now is no longer to him valuable, but to us it was Star Wars level right. technology. And, uh, and people started donating a little bit here, like, you know, like really, when I say a little bit, like $5 here, 20 bucks yeah. there, and we started this process. And uh, and it took two years. It took the shooting was forty two days. It took nearly two years to edit it and put a soundtrack on it. And in that time, uh, people started getting involved with with uh, somehow it got out. Greg Marks, who's the alchemist who put this together, he took one hundred and sixty hours of tape and 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 put this together. But um, when we finished shooting, we didn't know what to do. There was, as I said, one hundred and sixty hours of tape in a shoebox. Right. And we bought that that program, Final Cut Pro, right. and we were like three three monkeys. You know how to do that? No, you know how to do that? no. You know, so we, you know, we thought maybe we'd learn how to edit film in our spare time. You right. Know? And uh, I was in graduate school, and they were working full time in restaurants, and we were supposed to, so we didn't. So the shoebox stood in our closet for months, and then Greg Marks <coughs> came on the scene, and uh, that he came from New York to do some meaningful film work, and. He met the guys and they uh, they met at a fundraiser and they started talking and says, "Yeah, well, we have this 160 hours of tape. Well, let me just take it out." So he takes it home, and the next morning he had watched a whole bunch of tapes through the night. Throughout, he watched it throughout, throughout the night. Calls up one of the guys crying in the morning. Do you guys have any idea of what you have here? Oh, I just have chills. And the three, oh. you know, the three monkeys looked at each other and said, "No," and. Greg Marks uh, on a shoestring, and I mean a shoestring. Like yeah. we pulled together whatever we could to pay him fifteen hundred bucks a month. Mm. He barely kept his lights on, and he put this thing together. He wove. There was all this yarn yes. that we had, and he took. He found the threads of gold, and wove a tapestry that's this final print. And um, and uh, um, and we've we've been touring the touring the film around the country always to remarkably wonderful responses and because it's a documentary film we're still it's, you know it's challenging it's a process and yeah, yeah so we're still we're still uh, open to any brilliant financial Pop planning possibilities ideas and yeah. opportunities. <laughs> possibilities and opportunities <laughs> I'm, I'm ready not, I'm ready to uh, I'm ready to accept I'm ready to receive okay so um, I'd actually like to show a couple more clips from the film and uh, let me can we um, what I'd like to do is show the clip that is um, 
Well, first, one of the clips I want to show is of you doing the agreement um, of moving oh, yes. into the process. Which, of it. by the way, uh, poetically enough, that was on Valentine's Day. Oh my gosh, you're kidding. Would I lie to you? Oh, that's so <laughs> sweet, and it uh, it is all about it, it love. It was on Valentine's Day, yes, indeed. Okay. So, in fact, why don't we just go there? Because the other clip, I, well, the other one was was um, was of you with all the medication and you know the choices. But we've kind of already covered that. So why don't we, if we can actually talk about the agreement? And one of the reasons that um, I wanted to bring that in is because even with the private client work that I do, I ask people to sign an agreement. All right. Because it's so empowering and I think powerful when you actually have a document that is printed out that um, you go through and the details of it and just like a contract you know an agreement for business right, right? Well, it's a commitment it wasn't it certainly wasn't uh, an enforceable document right what it was what uh, was something actually in my opinion deeper because I've broken enforceable documents in my you know, mm -hmm. in my life I'm not proud of it but I have this one uh, was something else I, when you when you see your words yeah and they have nothing to do with do this or else right it's it's uh, where it becomes something on a soul level mm -hmm. right? and so uh, I valued I, I was confronted with with maintaining my integrity and I, I had I had no idea I didn't, when I met these guys until I signed it I, I didn't realize that the depth of what you were getting into the, that's one thing but the 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 depth of of, of how much i valued Your my word. word yeah and uh, no none of us had any idea if they had any idea of what they were getting into i don't know if they would have done it and that's the beauty and of I mean, life maybe you wouldn't have either the beauty and the tragedy of life is that we don't know what's going to happen right well it's funny about that with uh, two things a couple things actually one about the agreement is that um, I think a lot of people uh, take for granted, you know, when we give our word and when we actually stick to our word. It's in, in when you know having it be impeccable with your word is one of the four agreements. Right. Um, right. But when you really are, are willing to have that commitment to your word, how absolutely powerful that is, not only not only for other people but for yourself. And that's why it was so. Um, drawn to them showing you doing the agreement because I think I have a feeling you tell me it, that's kind of when it really started to set in what you were doing kind of really started it to started it was it's it started it, it did begin it started to set in what I was like uh oh like, <laughs> like what the hell am I getting into you know, and uh, and there was a moment where I was resistant you know, mm -hmm. and like oh, I, you think? Well, yeah, <laughs> and 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 it was the part where I I look at it in retrospect, where I thought I didn't understand what he was saying, but I I think what it was was I didn't want to hear what he was saying. Right. But there was actually no way out. Right. Like there was no no real legitimate way out of there. Mm -mm. And um, and I, you know, and I'm grateful I did it. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful. You know, and the other thing too is because um, I'm going to be doing something similar uh, in just a, yeah, within just a couple of weeks. Actually, I'm committing to um, going more raw and also doing a whole detox and cleanse, something I did about eight nine years ago. But I'm going to bring it into the show because I have a feeling. Um, well, one thing is I think it's so empowering when you really just are a, sh a way shower and you are a way shower that people really have a role model and they get to see what it looks like mm. um, to the commitment and the depth of where you need to go when you do want to transform and make changes. And especially, you know, if we look at this in the macrocosm, because humanity is a choice point. So if we really look at what it takes individually, what's it going to take collectively? Um, okay, we're ready. We're going to watch the, we're going to watch the agreement. So, uh, read this, right? I agree to eat three meals at Cafe Gratitude, which are approved by either Matthew or Tersus. Two, I agree to complete my daily logbook every day, all portions, at breakfast. Okay. I agree to do my daily affirmation every day when I wake up and every night before bed. I agree to walk 15 minutes every day, yes. 
I agree to order my food in its affirmation name. I agree to drink a gallon of water a day, and I agree to call either Carrie, Connor, or Ryland and communicate whether I have completed my daily agreements or not. I agree to be on time for all my appointments. I agree gratefully and happily to be on time for all my divine important appointments. I agree to not degrade myself. I agree not to degrade myself. I agree to relate to my food as medicine and my medicine as my food. Ah, yes. I agree to be coachable and be in this project with a beginner's mind. Yes, I do. I absolutely have my word. Um, I understand and agree to relate to Connor, Carrie, and Rylan as coaches and my coaches in the transformation of my life. What is that? I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, that's I, well, it's kind of like you, you respect. Are, well, no, it's like a coach, like like to understand that we are your coach. Like if you're an athlete and the game that we're playing is the transformation of your life, you're that you're the player in that, and we're your coach. And just like to know that that's when we say things to you and like when we it's because we are coaching you in getting this surrender already resisting yeah it's great yeah already resisting but i agree okay so there we were there you were making your agreement and so you said something at the very beginning of the show about willingness now what's interesting about that is I actually have a video up on YouTube um, which is entitled The Alchemy of Yes mm -hmm. and it's all about when, we, when we're willing that actually changes our brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. So going back to what I was even talking about the, at the beginning which I didn't get into because we weren't able to show the, some of the clips that I wanted to show but um, that our brain chemistry actually changes when we say yes when we have a willingness to do something. So what did you experience once you signed that agreement? At the time, I, I really still didn't know what I was getting into. And uh, what did I, at the time, uh, yeah, I didn't know what I was getting into, but I knew that, I knew that like, if I had to do these things, I was gonna do them. Yeah. And I didn't know what, quote unquote, these things actually were because at the time, I, I really had no idea about Any the raw food world. Right. I thought vegan was a planet you know, <laughs> right. that, that Spock directed Chekhov to plot a course for. Right. I had no idea what these things were. I didn't, and and so it, it didn't, you know, it didn't really hit me. And the other thing that people often ask is, or, or comment on, is the courage that it took to be that open. And so I used to be a little uncomfortable with that because it's not like there was. It was this kid with a little camera and and a boom mic that was made out of PVC pipe. So it didn't have the gravitas of a Spielberg set. Right. And so and and so I just I just kept going. It was just basically they were shooting my life as I went on. Right. Uh, the the thing that you said earlier I I think is very poignant is that what certain things look like. For example, uh, it's good to see it's 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 good to see the, the before and after. I think it's equally, if not more, important to see the during. Yeah. And uh, because it, it's not that simple. It's not like ordering the ab machine on late night cocaine television and think that you're going to fix everything with the ab machine. No, it's a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to see what things look like, and, and for I'll take it to a really personal experience uh, my experience relationships yeah. with my romantic relationships were most of them were very turbulent mm -hmm. most of them um, but it wasn't until recently that like when I say recently within the past two years that I actually saw what love looked like I had no idea what it looked like to genuinely be, be loved by someone mm -hmm. I didn't know. Now it doesn't mean that people didn't love me, right. but I didn't have, I didn't have enough enough of the veils off of my vision, right, f to, to to see it. Mm -hmm. And once I saw it, it wasn't. There was no way of putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Mm -hmm. You can't go back. No. Nope. Uh, to go back is to die. Right. And so you're right. I really agree with you to show to show it. And the thing I the thing about our film 
is that that I like is it brings it down to a blue collar working class right. spiritual warrior appro approach. Yeah. It's not um, it's not a highfalutin guy sitting on top on top of a stage that seems to have all of his stuff together. Right. Because I don't yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. I never never arrived. I just go from station to station and hopefully get you know. And I believe we're all on the same train right. going in the, going to the same place. Right. It's important for people to have room to fall. Right. If they fall. Right. It doesn't make them wrong. Right. And um, and sometimes people also use a fall as an excuse to go back to where they were because it's familiar and it's comfortable. And there's that perverse comfort in what's familiar. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there's also there's also a, is a price for that. Yes. I'd like to go back to a couple things. One is um, what what you were talking about that you really didn't know what you were getting into. And sort of like you, today when I came here, right? <laughs> I, was like, I had no idea, on. but you look pretty safe. You weren't armed. <laughs> I figured, okay, we'll have fun. Um, okay. So the, uh, yeah, we're going to, we're, we're going to do the loving yourself clip next, but, um, here's what I like to go back to a couple things. One is you didn't know what you were getting into really. And, um, you didn't, uh, you were, um, doing this agreement and there were things that didn't make sense to you because what you, this kind of the space that you were in is what I refer to as a lot of people are in the I don't know what I don't know space and especially when it comes to transformation so it's like I'm going to be talking a lot more in future shows about alchemical process and DNA transformation and activations and brain chemistry and this whole transformation that the planet is going through with the grids and the matrix and the grid within our body and the, all of this, right? So a lot of people are going to be in the, I don't know what I don't know, but that's okay. It's more than okay. Exactly. Yeah. It's more than okay. Because everything you know has got you to this place. Right. Right, so so the I don't know is, is part of the hero's journey that, that Joseph Campbell, who I, you know, like, my man, mm -hmm. talks about. And that's the ordeal. Mm -hmm. The idea of the, the, the circle of, of the, the, you know, the, the hero's journey, the circle, is the, you know, you, you, the, the, the initial is the, the initial part <laughs> is the departure where you leave what's familiar. Right. And at one point you, you confront your demons, which are always within, and you go through an ordeal. Mm -hmm. And eventually you come back home to share that experience and then do that again. And, and, and again, this is not, you know, also Joseph Campbell, the, the, you know, the whole, the whole uh, uh, Pema Chodone talks about being the, discovering the comfort in, in not knowing. Right. And the unfamiliar. And, and it's in Buddhism. It's, a, it's, it's just being... I think that what, you, what you're saying, what we're talking about right now is absolutely imperative right now for people to really grasp um, and the reason that I wanted to bring that back in is because this shift that I think that we're about to experience even way more than we have yet um, and my guides actually were just saying this to me a few days ago is that um, it's really important right now for people to just let go of the old paradigm the old um, aspects, the systems, you know, that you were saying that we're, so many people are tied into, their lives depend on these systems. The more that people can let go of and, al and allow that paradigm and that reality to unwind and release, the, su the faster we can move into this shift, mm -hmm. this new paradigm, where um and be in surrender and be in the openness like what you were experiencing when you said yes you weren't sure what you were saying yes to i had no idea right so and that is, that is so powerful right there and the other thing too is they were talking about um in the agreement being coachable and that's the other thing too is i think that there's going to be so many people that as we move through this shift they don't know what the heck is going on but if they are willing to be coachable and just be in surrender, like what did you experience by being in surrender and just being coachable at that point? And how old was this? How old were you? I was 54 at the time. Okay. And the, the thing about... So, so you were not a... You're, you're, oh, no. You're an, you would be considered an old dog, right? In the old paradigm. Yeah, except to somebody who was 60. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, that sixty is the new thirty. So, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's the new black. So, 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 uh, 
Yeah, the, the to be the old the the old um, shul the old shul, uh, the old shuls the old in 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 the Jewish tradition where uh, the rabbi went and taught was designed so that the students were always above the rabbi, so he have to look up to enable him to maintain a sense of humility. Interesting. I can't learn anything if I think I know everything. Absolutely. And um, and and um, and so it requires it, it requires a, a, a degree of surrender. And it's important to recognize that those things are in, in the new age world and in some, some of the stuff that's in this, in this so-called spiritual world. We we talk about with a degree of 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 um, almost flippantly about certain things. It is. An, I feel that as an elder, I consider myself an elder now. And I recognize that it's about it's about walking the talk. Yeah. And and if I talk about surrender, then I have to be able to surrender something I really don't want to surrender. Yeah. And then I think that you think about like a child. My daughter used to have the blanket thing going. She used to suck the blanket. And it was mm -hmm. thought into affect her the shape of her teeth and all that stuff. What it took for, for us to have her let that go. Wow. Yeah. At the time, it was a really. It took a lot of patience. Yeah. And you know, when you think about some of the some of the biblical things that is said, like for example, the meek shall inherit the earth, right? The patience that it takes as parents, the love that it takes as parents to do to get your kids to do the right thing, sometimes and a degree of sternness. But I'm saying, say a little kid that you got to take the blanket away because it's starting to affect her health. Well being, right? And so, how to do that lovingly? And it's not our orientation. We want a, we want an antibiotic. God damn it, we want this. You know, yeah. the, and so we want an immediate instant gratification. It takes too long. And when I think about the meek and hurting the earth, it's really there's a lot of power in exhibiting patience, mindfulness, intelligence, prudence, all those things that really take a tremendous amount of introspection and a tremendous amount of. Of, uh, of really of, of self-sacrifice, sacrificing the immediate gratification, right. which, by the way, I've never been good at, right. Right? <laughs> considering I was a drug addict and an alcoholic for 25 years. You know, inst again, instant gratification took too long. Most of this, this, the second half of my life has been learning or unlearning so many things so that I can learn another way of being. And, and, uh, and so... Being. It, 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 it's, it's, being. What did I say? Being. I just want to actually... Oh, did I say bean? No. No, you <laughs> said it right, but I, I'm actually really... I want to bring that to the mm. forefront. Being. Because so many of us have been living in the doing. Right, right. And it was it, what um, I experienced um, that watching you was actually coming in contact with your beingness. Right. And it was very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's very uncomfortable if if you if if you've lived a life of of uh, self loathing, mm -hmm. which is rooted in fear. Yes. Uh, for so many years, you know, it's not like you know. I, I that's I was terrified that if I looked deep enough, that I was gonna what I was gonna find was what I thought was there. Mm -hmm. I th first of all, I, I thought there was nothing there. Right. And I thought whatever I would find there wasn't you know was going to be less than adequate. Right. And it's it's the opposite. It's the Emersonian journey without dis the journey without distance. The eighteen mm -hmm. inches between my head and my heart, and the idea of of being it, the it takes so much fortitude to be vulnerable. Yep. Because at the, at in the seat of vulnerability that is is in, in the center of vulner being vulnerable being in the vulnerability place. Is also the seat of creativity. Yeah, it's the seat of love. It's where it's where I can actually genuinely connect with you. That's right. I, I have to be seen in order to be seen. I have to be naked, to yes. s s figuratively speaking. Yeah. I have to be naked, and that's a very vulnerable, scary place. It's also where shame runs rampant. It's mm -hmm. like there. So all of those things, and to sit in that space, it, it's, it takes a tremendous amount of internal of, of spiritual fortitude. Absolutely. The difference between spiritual fortitude and physical physical strength is in physical strength the practice is after it's resistance and you know, it's it's resistance and 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 exertion and resistance exertion and resistance. 
The spiritual muscle, on the other hand, requires silence and stillness. Mm -hmm. And if you're used to resistance and force, that's a very scary place to be. You've just touched on so many different things. And um, the, the, I'm just going to put a spiritual slant on what you just talked about in regard in regards to the resistance. As opposed to the, the pedestrian force. nature that I expressed myself. No. The, <laughs> <laughs> and about the vulnerability. Because we, I think, are on this planet, we, with all the fear and survival, so many people are ashamed at where they are right now, I think, especially financially. And, oh, this is interesting. I just thought of this. One of my, my guides actually came in. I was channeling information about a month and a half ago. And they said, if people only had, they had no personal belongings left, and they only had their choices, what choices would they be making? In their for their lives right now do you know what I mean but going to what you're just taught what you were talking about in regards to the vulnerability is that I think that is part of that's like um if we have a checklist of humanities at, at choice point how do we go from breakthrough to break 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 down to breakthrough that at the top of the list is a willingness to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and a willingness to that 18 inches because one of the taglines of this show is the journey from our head to our heart is that willingness to take that journey and to and we couldn't be sitting here having this kind of conversation if we didn't have two hearts open communicating mm -hmm. through open heart vulnerability willingness etc correct so the mask what you were just talking about also I just want to bring this into presence is that forceful energy is the masculine energy and the sitting and being in the stillness is the feminine energy. And we need both of those to be in balance in ourselves before we can even experience mm -hmm. it out there in the, in the big world. Correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think this is actually a perfect time. If we are cued, I'd love to go to the loving yourself part of the, um, of the film. Okay. The whole thing started off of me being impacted by him saying, for his body to look like it does, you don't feel like you're gonna be able to love yourself enough that someone else would love you. And here we are starting this process of you loving yourself and loving your body on Valentine's Day. Four ounces of wheatgrass. Oh joy. In the morning, yeah. And then you're gonna, we're gonna give you a smoothie that's gonna be mostly coconut milk with figs, cacao, which is chocolate, vitamin or green, like a super concentrated green smoothie food. And it's gonna have a few dates in it. Okay, so your midday meal is the enchilada with a salad and a 16 ounces of I Am Healthy, which is the, the kale, celery, cucumber, We had that lemon yesterday. Juice. That's the one your brother has a hard time downing. Yes. Oh. Look at that breakfast. Uh, Let's have a shot of that breakfast. Yeah. Oh. So Frank, when you are renewed, one thing you can sure of, like almost every nutrient that exists exists in there. Like that you could live on. Mm -hmm. This is just your treat. That you could live on. This looks like it should be mowed. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. And it actually was mowed and then it turned into that. And the taste is repulsive to the degree that you need to detox. Oh, how convenient. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> and it's funny that he says that because just yesterday, you know, Frank does know almost everything. Yeah. And he was talking about espresso and that, you know, he has, you know, four or five shots of espresso and he realizes at this point, four and five shots is still not carrying him through the day. Right. I'm just using coffee like an amphetamine, you know, yeah. essentially to get it past that next. And what I mentioned to him yesterday was I noticed the workshop that when you and your, and Terses, you and your wife got, at nine o'clock in the morning, you, when you're starting, you look exactly the same at six, which I'm ready to collapse, you know? <laughs> I'm looking for a place to hide and go to sleep. But but you have remained consistent. You know, you're not up, you're not down. And and I noticed that, and that looked really attractive to me. And here it is, with, okay. with the stuff that's in the back of the lawnmower. And Just drink it. Don't down the whole thing. Medicine. Remember, it's not food, it's medicine. You got that right. The only thing missing is a little, little, add a little quinine to it, why don't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, let's let's talk about that, because you just mentioned a couple minutes ago about self-loathing. 
and uh, what it took for you to go from and recognize self-loathing to loving yourself because that was a big part of this journey right they they really encouraged affirmations mm -hmm. and um, looking in the mirror what was that what did you have to do not have to but what did you get to do what did I get to do yeah. <laughs> what did I joyfully engage in uh, I was uh, the, well, the, the the affirmations for me were, were one of the hardest practices it was I, I felt like my intestines were un unraveling. It mm. was so difficult to look in the mirror. It felt so disingenuous. It, 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 it felt stupid. It felt disingenuous. It felt like I thought that God himself would come down and punish me for the magnitude of this lie. Mm -hmm. and, oh, uh, funny. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, and so it's, it also indicates where the work is physically because mm -hmm. I felt it in my body. You felt. I felt certain when I when I would say certain things, I would feel some. I, I didn't. I couldn't identify because I, I I wasn't familiar with that whole world, and I I was that I was very out of touch with my body. Yeah, the emotional connection with the physical body. S yes, exactly. So uh, I I recognize. Uh, I think most people are. I think most people are too. Mm -hmm. uh, especially I, especially since if you don't look like a cover of a magazine. Mm -hmm. And I and so if you really want to challenge yourself with affirmations, do it in front of the mirror naked. Mm -hmm. And I, I I still like it's sometimes it's difficult still. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's much easier. And the the, the journey of self love is an is an interesting topic because I think a lot of people uh, these days get stuck in this thing where self love is and self care have become this notion of like. Thai massages and pedicures and getting your chakras aligned when in fact and I, well, I can't do I can't go out there and do that right now I'm working on myself I'm in I'm healing and I think that's a bunch of BS because I think that that you have to get out there and interact and give love in order to in order to feel and, and, and you have to you have to, to you have to get a, a get outside of yourself and get into the rhythm of of your brother's heart in order to experience the love that's in your heart. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way I see it. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, of um, I can't do this right now, I'm healing, is, uh, is, is just another, it's, it's kind of selfish and, and really uh, nowhere a place to be. Well, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually counter that. Good. <laughs> it's, the, it's the friction in the oyster that creates the pearl. Because some of the, right now, especially because I think a lot of people are coming out of isolation for many, for several years, and um, there is healing. And so even that, that um, I, I'm just going to say there needs to be a balance. I agree. I, I'm not, I mean, and an I, honoring I, of, I, I agree. I, I meditate and pray in the morning and, and there's a difference. There's, there's a, uh, there's, there's, there's a definitely a place for solitude. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not. In any way, shape, or form, minimizing the value of that, to use that as a way of not doing work with others, because it's in the forgiving it's that both. we are forgiven. It's really in the interaction. If you know, there's there's not there's only a few people that can actually go to the mountaintop and like live in a cave. Mm -hmm. Most of us, most of us, and, and to do the work that you're talking about requires interaction. When I don't feel like it, yeah. Well, and um, the other thing, too, is what the, I also would like to bring up is that when you do interact with people, that off, that's really when you see where you have triggers, where you've oh, got yeah. issues. Yeah, and when I'm by myself, everything's going everything's pretty great. damn smooth. <laughs> what could go wrong? Right. But then put, put particularly, particularly familial relationships and romantic relationships, mm -hmm. Uh, will definitely bring up what you what what one needs to work on, and I also believe, given, you know, being that we're talking about relations for for a second, is that fundam I believe that at, at its root, at the root, all relationships are the same. Mm -hmm. the, the the fundamental what the, the 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 foundation of all relationships are the same. How we the the expression manifests in that relationship may differ. So the way I treat my son will be different than the way I treat my mother. But at the root of it, it's all a loving relationship and rooted in integrity, love, and et cetera. 
Right. And so to you know, so I, I don't believe in the notion of compartmentalizing relationships mm -hmm. at all. No, no, exactly. Okay, so how do you if somebody was in a in a an experience in their life mm. of that self loathing and or not really even having in, in the conversation of loving themselves because I actually have a hundred and eight day program that it's an email campaign that is free for people. It's called I, 108 Days of I Am Loving Myself. Mm. And I think it's one of the most underrated, untalked about conversations um, on the planet. So if somebody wasn't really, this is maybe kind of a new conversation for them. And I think, and I also want to have a, say a disclaimer. I think a lot of people say logically, oh, sure, I love myself. But when it really comes down to it, standing in front of that mirror naked or being willing to expose, being vulnerable, and not having shame or um, wanting to hide, you know, the even the emotional stuff. I think that there's a lot of people on the planet who um, are not really in alignment with loving themselves fully, inside and out. Well, that's very clear. Turn on television and you'll see that. Reality shows, for example, oh. and all those things. And, and really, Don't get me the, 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 on that. The, 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 the things that we initially, that we began with in the, in the program indicate that. It's not separate. What's happening with the bank, there are human beings running that. Yeah. And those human beings, it's not like some kind of machine that ran, ran amok. Mm -hmm. It's a human beings that are at the helm of that and the human beings that created it and human beings that can shift it. So what you're seeing is, a, is 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 all this neurosis magnified. Right. And so if somebody really wasn't in that conversation yet in their lives, right. what would you say to them to just give them a kickstart in that direction from your experiences? I wonder, sometimes I wonder if there's something you can actually say mm -hmm. rather than demonstrate that uh, uh, it's um, the information's all out there. Marion Williamson says the time of downloading is over. Right. We have all the information within ourselves. Now, what and outside of ourselves? And John Lennon said it too. You can't say anything. You know, can't do anything that hasn't been done. Or say anything that hasn't been said. And Dylan and they also re alluded to that. And uh, uh, and. Technology, you know, okay, well, so we now have a different kind of technology, but essentially, I think that human beings, human beings like to, like to think that that their internal landscape is in lockstep with technological advancement, mm -hmm. and it's not. Right. And um, so, what would I say to someone? I, I, I um, at this moment, I can't think of anything really. I wish I could think of something really profound, except that when I've when I've learned something, it's by it's by watching someone else. It's like parenting. Mm -hmm. My, you know, I, I was parented in such a way that do what I say, not what I do. Right. Don't and question. so there was this, there was this duplicity all the time. Right. And, um, and at, I think at the root of it, you think about, you know, what would have happened if Hitler got admitted to art school and somebody says, "Oh, I love that painting, Adolf." Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it's it's really, I think that all all the tragedies. And uh, and uh, all the beauty and all the tragedy in the world is has is rooted in people's desire to be loved. I agree. All of it, the greatness and the horror, right. is is in people's desire to to to, ex to experience genuine love in mm -hmm. their lives. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, there's the psychopaths. Yes, there's the crazies. But even that poor bastard in the in the in Aurora, you know, people are going to say, "Oh, you said that something went wrong." Right. Something went wrong somewhere along the line. Something went wrong, right. and and um, of course I'm not condoning what happened at all. It's just that something went wrong, and one of the one of the tragedies of our time is is our resistance, our reluctance, or absolute refusal to look at causes and conditions. Right. We have more people in jail in our country than in China. Right. They have a billion people in China. Wait, they're nicer. What you know, like so. So we they don't get caught. So what we do is we build more prisons rather than look at causes and conditions, because causes and conditions requires a softness, an introspection, a critical thinking, 
and critical thinking counters this counters this notion of building more prisons of punishment. And one other thing I wanted to mention that I think was really important in the transformational experience, what I learned mm -hmm. was my attachment to these feelings, of these negative feelings. If you were to say, if we, you and I were sitting over coffee, I would swear to you up and down, no, I don't want to be anxious. Of course I want to feel serene. And yet, and yet, my life was dominated by these feelings of anxiety or these feelings of depression or these feelings of the other shoes going to drop and impending doom. I had these, and, and I, didn't, I had no idea of how attached I was to these feelings. Hmm. And the reason I was attached to them, I mean, I, first of all, I had them a long time. Right. But they were initially, they initially developed out of a sense of survival. Right. In my, in my childhood. Right. And, and so to let, even though they no longer served me and they had nothing to do with the moment, they were still in there. And the idea of letting go of those feelings would generate a level of life and death anxiety yeah. because they were rooted in my belief that this is how I survived. Right. And even though they have nothing to do with the moment, and I thought, wow, you know, I'm really, I really am attached. And I thought, okay, so making the choice, the choice point that you like to talk about, it, it definitely, it's, it's not just a choice. I have to carve a new neural pathway yes. for that feeling to drop into because its normal go-to place was to acquiesce to and to uh, to to um to validate that yes. belief do yep. something so now i have to have another go-to place for that feeling when that feeling erupts of fear to like okay well instead of going to the normal place where i went to where I, oh my god i have to watch out and then and then prepare myself for what i believe was going to happen go to the go to this other place right Right. And that takes time to carve a new neural pathway. If you're farming, it takes time to till the earth and make that, you know, no, that new furrow. This is exactly what I was talking about at the beginning of the show. This is exactly what Bruce Lipton talks about and this whole the neural pathways in the brain and having that a path, that that path of a new of a new thought process. Right. And the, and I'm so glad you brought up the whole thing about attachment. Because I think that people don't really even realize how attached they are in that fear and survival. Mm -hmm. The brain, it's a, it's a brain situation with the medulla and the amygdala. And once that that's triggered, and you talked about the wild animal, you know, the, in, at the beginning of the show as well, is that we, are, we feel that we are um, oftentimes when we're in that fear and survival, it's, an, it's like there's an impending attack. Almost right. constant, right? And and, and uh, I'm sorry. No, that. And yeah. so there's a, a wonderful uh, scene in Dead Poets Society mm -hmm. with Robin Williams, mm -hmm. and um, and he's like really being emphatic in this scene, and and he and he and he jumps on the desk, and he, and because he says sometimes you just gotta look, you, know, you gotta jump on the desk, you gotta you, know, you gotta look at the room from on top of the desk. Fabulous scene. That is in. That corresponds with the notion of turning the other cheek. Right. It means that to look at something with a different point of view, yes. with a different, a, you know, in a, from a different perspective, mm -hmm. and 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 that's what it means. It doesn't mean that you condone somebody's behavior. And right. It's like forgiveness. It doesn't mean you condone the behavior or that you you allow it to happen again. It means that you look at it from a different perspective. Right. And. And the four agreements, not taking anything personally. And there's an enormous amount of power in not taking something personally. Absolutely. And as a man, one of the things I've learned, because what I was, the way I was taught to be a man had nothing to do with being a man, is learning to dis the, 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 um, the immeasurably important distinction between power and force. Right. And how one is 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 unsustainable mm -hmm. and requires exertion and is rooted in fear, and the other requires no movement at all right. and is is inherent. Right, force being the first description and power being power the being you know power yeah. if you know, within is within true being yes yeah. and when and it's and with power. With power, you you exercise a sort of spiritual jujitsu, which is deflecting 
the negative. You don't actually attack somebody. Right. You're deflecting and using their force to, against them. Exactly. And so, you know, just to, to so, so all of these principles are ancient principles. Now, it's funny because I, I wanted to come back to something, and that is um, when I was writing up the description of this show, um, I actually referred to, uh, I think I actually said, it's like where, where we, in, in order to really have a choice, to go through this, the, where we are, the shift and choice point, it's like being an, an alcoholic that must come to terms, honestly, that there's a problem. And that happens, well, what, what's referred to, it happens at when, what, what's referred to as a bottom. Right, okay. And the bottom is, the bottom is, uh, it's, it's, it is the, it is the circle of hell that Dante hadn't conceived of. Mm -hmm. You know, Dante had nine. Okay. Alcoholics have a deeper one. Okay. And it's at that point when you've played your last card, you, you, you've all your best schemes, all your best plans, all your best ideas, all your maneuvering landed you in this place. And it's at that place where you have what we call a moment of clarity. And that moment of clarity is is you surrender that your way is not, not working. Worked. And now you have to ask for help. Yep. And the two the two things that I've learned that have saved my life mm -hmm. is I don't know would you help me? Mm -hmm. And it was I was taught from a young age to never say those things. And it wasn't until I reached a level that was lower than I ever hoped I ever go, and I wouldn't wish on anyone, that I got to a place where I began to, to crawl out of the place and ascend. C.S. Lewis says, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. Right. And I chose to... Like when I hit bottom, I just didn't hit bottom. I crawled around to right. see if there was a, a crevice a that I missed. Right. <laughs> you know, there there may have been, yeah, and so, and so the ascendance from that place mm -hmm. was difficult and painful, and what those and the, and I think that the function of those two experiences, the pain and the and the discomfort mm -hmm. of it, gave it greater value. Mm -hmm. And. Um, so when, because I feel like we're about ready to, on a collective... Bottom out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. I mean, every day I wonder what's, you know, what's next. And, you know, this, uh, this morning uh, on NPR, there was a guy, I, I just really was, it's just, I just this guy's, the image of this, is, of this voice was in my head all day. This guy... Uh, came out of a he, he was a businessman and was incredibly successful and and was in, involved with a number of businesses and philanthropies and you know hundreds of millions of dollars and he comes out of his office building or and, and, well somewhere in his office building and he tried to commit suicide and it failed mm -hmm. and I guess they I don't, I don't know the whole story but they rushed him to the hospital the cops had the suicide note in the suicide note he was apologizing for the 20 years and 200 million dollars that he embezzled and all these these things all these 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 criminal activities that he did that was today that was this morning and i'm thinking you know this guy it, it's like it, it it just it's just it's just again when is enough enough you 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 know, like it's just like you robbed two hundred million. Couldn't you stop at one? You know, it's right. like you know, or did you have to at all if you were that successful? You're generating that kind of that it's kind an of addiction, a, and it becomes the addiction is a is an indicator mm -hmm. because the alcohol, the money, the sex, you know, because people are addicted to all these power. It's an indicator because that's not the problem. The alcohol isn't the problem. In fact, in the beginning, it's a solution. Right. It is an indication of a deeper underlying condition. Right. And it's, in my opinion, it's always a soul sickness. Mm hmm Oh, <clears throat> speaking of which, so two things. One is, I think, and I didn't hear about this. I don't actually track the news. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I am aware, and there are people that send me things. I am aware um, that at this time, many of the deceptions as around the banking industry globally are coming out and gonna, more going to come out. So this doesn't surprise me about the suicide. I hadn't heard that, like I said. 
Um, and I think that this is the clearing out of, of um, more light on the planet is this is part of what the um, evidence of us really moving into a shift is. Um, but the other thing too is the um, how we look at it and getting to the truth of the bottom, the bottom of the matter and the truth of the matter is incredibly important right now. So just as um, with an addiction, you know, you said sex or it, drugs or alcohol, whatever it is, it's really coming clean to what the problem has been. Right. That's the first step, by right. the way. That's only the first, first step. step. And, and then there's the, there's the action that comes behind it. Right. Because I knew that I was an alcoholic before I did anything about it. I used mm -hmm. to make a joke about it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until uh, I could no longer live the way I was living. When I, had, when I was at the choice point was live or die. Right. Essentially. Right. And if you're an addict or an alcoholic. Literally alcohol live or die. Well, actually, if you're an alcoholic or an addict, there are actually worse things than dying. Right. And I, I, was, I was heading in that direction. And it was, it was really, it was a choice point. Right. I could no longer, I could no longer bear living the way I was living. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's unfortunate. It, it doesn't have to be that way. Right. It's, it's, it's not always necessary because there are people that I know people that have recovered and got into recovery before they were completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. They were able to stop before that and mm -hmm. save themselves years of, of, of hell. Mm hmm I, you know, I, I, um, I just hope, I mean, I, there's a part of me that, you know, there's a part of me that, that really feels that I have to throw myself into what, you know, this, into the work, because if I don't, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be part of the problem, and right. I don't want to be part of the problem. On the other hand, it's quite daunting. What, what we are facing is it really, is. really, 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 re I thought raising a teenager was difficult. Right. And raising a teenager sort of def took me away from the depth of what's going on now and seeing it. And, you know, it's just, my God, and we really have quite a road work, ahead of us. You know, and, and, and the idea of a immediate show, you know, of course, in miracles says that, you know, there are no hierarchy in miracles. It's just, you know, just miracles. Right. And so, you know, I, I just. I'm going by my own experience that I was really plucked from the jaws of just just unbelievable crisis mm -hmm. and somehow step by step was able to do it in my own life and I believe that that's that's what I have to offer is my experience that I of, of transcending that a day at a time and continuing to do that I haven't arrived and then share that with with whomever may find some inspiration or entertainment or enlightenment out, out of that you right. Know? right okay so the, one of the things that we haven't touched upon are the relationships. How the relationships in your life have shifted since you've made the choice to shift and transform. What what's transpired? And I know some of it's covered in the film, but well, the one of the things I spent a lot of my life, uh, I've spent a lot of my life trying to persuade people that didn't love me that they should. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, rather than really uh, enjoying and pursuing and um, and, uh, and 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 uh, nurturing the relationships that were that were, that were loving, I didn't. I wasn't doing that. And today, the relationships in my life are infinitely more positive mm -hmm. and interesting. I mean, I've, I've met interesting people along my life, mm -hmm. of course, but. Th these days, because of the work we're doing, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just, I, I'm just amazed at, at the, the the depth of um, caring and and love that people are, are, are in my life express, and and um, I um, I'm really moved and humbled by it. The people that communicate with me as a result of the film, because mm -hmm. uh, there are times that I, I get very discouraged. Mm -hmm. I get discouraged because. For one thing, there's like there's always like there's always like the the, the 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 financial thing looming, and it's kind of scary, particularly when you're at my point of life. I, you know, like, and and there's all the all the negative mean voices that come about. You know, you you, know, you should be this. You should, the shoulds. Yeah. 
And then I, I get. See, are you shitting on yourself? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I get uh, a correspondence from someone. Um, for example, there's this uh, young individual. I mean, really young and just absolutely lovely individual in their 20s that just got diagnosed with MS and is uh, suffering through treatments but feels inspired because of the film mm. to try various forms, various uh, other approaches to treatment and, and that she f and this person feels encouraged to... And I'm thinking, really? Like, and then I... Th and so I think, wow... Well, Okay, well, maybe this is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, where do you? And besides, at this point, yeah, where am I going to go to an office? I mean, <laughs> I mean like really, it's like right. you know, I, I probably, I don't know, I don't know if I'm employable at this point, quite frankly. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, well, I, you know, I, I just so so there are times when I get very discouraged, mm -hmm. and and yet when I do get discouraged, the universe sends me something to say, listen, not yet. Right. Not yet. And uh, an old mentor told me that uh, God answers prayers in three ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, and not yet. Oh, right. I get not yet all, all the, time. the time. All the time. I get not yet. So, okay, man. Well, I, actually, that's great because uh, there's one other thing I wanted to come back to. And w w it goes, Only one? Yeah. You've been, you're like Colombo. You've been saying that for the past hour. <laughs> one more thing. One, ju one, just one more thing. <laughs> Has it been fun, though? <laughs> yeah, you know what it has. I can't okay. wait to see this. This is wild. Soul agreements. So, Soul agreements. Mm -hmm. So, now, when you were signing the agreement, mm -hmm. um, what came to my mind is that one of the things that I talk about is uh, that we all have soul agreements and soul assignments. And I'm kind of bringing this full circle because now where you are, and oh, am I, I don't think I'm employable at this point because really what you did is you stepped into a soul agreement. Right. And you... I must have been so stoned when I signed <laughs> this paper. I must have been so messed up, man. That must have been like Thai weed or something, man. Because like, I signed In some agreements. In the lettuce wrap. I, I, yeah, I mean, I signed some agreements that I signed up. For, what? 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 Where? Show me. And the camera was rolling, so you, know. you couldn't take it. Oh. <laughs> so just really bringing it full circle is that we, I believe, we've all come here with different soul assignments, soul agreements, and that it's that saying yes and that willingness and to stepping into for the transformation that we're really here to experience is to continuously express through us the gifts that we have to share with people and to be willing and open to allowing to continue to be revealed, be revealed, be revealed more of who we are. So um, you're now at a place where you're writing, where you mm -hmm. probably, I don't think you were writing back then, the what you're writing now. Not like now, no. no. I, I uh, What I have now is, um, is uh, a really, I have an editor who gets on my case and it's different. You know, before it was just sort of whims it was whimsical. Oh no, no, she's not a coach. Okay. She's a Nazi. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's not a coach. She's a uh, she's uh, an amazing, uh, amazing, amazing editor. Her name is De Deborah Olivier, who wrote um, what French women know. It was written. Oh yeah. Yeah. The the, uh, the premise is that the French women are are aware of the brevity of time and the value mm. of pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought I could talk to her, <laughs> and uh, and I have a you know and I have a literary agent which was amazing, and so now there's there's a commitment, and so the the writing uh, is the writing now is is takes on a whole different texture and and uh, urgency. And how what's your plan at this point to get out and support and be with people and express more of the gifts of transformation? We're touring the film. Still, mm -hmm. uh, I will be uh, going to of all places, Vegas, the s the spiritual center of the United uh -huh. States, the vortex, anchoring light yeah, and love yeah, the, in Las Vegas yeah, at the Luxor, <laughs> yeah. live at the Luxor. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas! Viva transformational <laughs> experience! And I guess there'll be slot machines with kale and. <laughs> 
That would be funny, yeah, kale actually. Kale and wheatgrass and, right. you know, and, and angel, car, angel cards. There we angel go. Angel cards, yes. Tarot. And, uh, yeah, instead of 21, it'll be tarot, you know. Um, <laughs> 18. 18, yes. Yeah, so, nine of cups. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> and uh, and so, yeah, so I, I've been on a few speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing, I'm promoting that and, and uh, touring with the film and, uh, and writing the book. Right. I'm also going to doing a workshop in Sicily. Oh, September. And that's your home. I've Paris. never been. Oh, yes. okay. I'm doing my Kunta that's Kinte thing. That's your lineage. Thing. Okay. Or Michael Corleone, pick your guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then October 20th, I'm going to New Zealand. Oh, places, I've been there. Because I I had no idea that the film was actually well received in Australia, which I didn't know. Yes. So uh, so those are coming up. So Australia and New Zealand, there's a there's a large contingency of people who are waking up. Uh, um, amazing. Amazing. For a culture that's rooted in rum. Oh right. <laughs> they're doing pretty good. <laughs> this, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here and. Thank you. This is great. Going with the flow and you know little rough patches here and there, but. Oh Can well. you really do anything else, though? You know, no. I mean, know. really, could you go against the flow? I mean, it's like, I don't want to be. I, I don't really. <laughs> of all the animals in the animal kingdom, a salmon is the last thing I'd want to be. Yep. And that's what oh, I. Yeah, and, right. And, and that's what I've been. Right. You know? I mean, he's got to go through a lot of trouble for a little love. Yeah. <laughs> little love. Getting. Going upstream yeah. the whole way just to have a little. Yeah, yeah just. Yeah. I've done fun. that. It's like. It's really not been worth there, it. I've done that. Yeah. Right. No. You're absolutely right. No. So, um, can we do. Yes. I'd like to actually. This is going to be. And then I'm going to come back after this. Um, yeah, Eminem. Um, I, this is, I know it's a little interesting. The singer? Mm-hmm. Oh. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring in the music video and, um, the first time I saw this music video, um, which is the first time I heard the song and, uh, this, the title is I'm Not Afraid. And it was very interesting. It was actually riveting for me because I, I saw it and I heard the words and I saw the music video that they created and I knew that he, he created and wrote the song because he was breaking free from what I call the enslavement matrix. And that's part of, well, actually last week's show was all about um, transcending the, the enslavement matrix, disentangling. And so this song um, is extremely powerful. So, um, yep. And so we're going to, I'll come back after Eminem. And just wrap up the show. And thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you. I'm grateful. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I know some of you might be a little bit surprised that I chose to play Eminem. And uh, I hope that as you were able to listen to and see the music video, that you might have a different experience if you had seen it before. I'm pretty sure that, um, and the first time, like I said, I saw this, it was riveting to me. And I actually started crying because um, I got very emotional because I really feel that he is displaying an incredible power for transformation. And I have a feeling also that it has to do, and he didn't say some of the specific words, I have a feeling that it has to do with him also pulling out of the enslavement matrix and any potential Illuminati type of um, hold that he, they can they have on many of the musicians and have had um, infiltration in many years, and so that to me is incredibly powerful, and that is a representation also of how powerful it is when we take a stand for our individual lives and just as Frank displayed so beautifully. And I hope that you catch and will uh, actually go watch May I Be Frank. It's very, very powerful, very transformative. And he took a stand for his life. And that's where we're at. That's where I feel that we are at choice point. You know, humanity is at choice point. 
and that we need to come clean with ourselves what is what's in breakdown so that we can actually get and transition through to break through and just as Eminem was saying is I'm not afraid I'm not afraid to take a stand and as we collectively do that and in just a few weeks um, by next week I will be announcing the first date that Cobra and I and others will be holding um, our first unified field call and this call will be for anchoring a new paradigm activating a new timeline and that reality is just ready and waiting for us to step out of the fear and survival as a collective consciousness of just even a couple thousand half a million people doing that to fully bring into expression the new paradigm now by no stretch of stretch of the imagination in what frank was saying i agree with we have uh, some tough times ahead of us and the, my guides have been coming in actually saying a lot in the last couple weeks um, that is an upheaval and every single day I'm getting communication that we are in upheaval and there is much more upheaval coming. The good news is and what I'm really going to encourage people to be through this journey is to one allow ourselves to release all attachments to the old paradigm two be willing to be vulnerable and be real with yourself and to notice where you have shadows coming up where you have woundedness and another thing is for us to collectively unify and create that unification because where two or more are gathered and then we activate that unified field, oh my gosh, I have already seen incredible, profound results. And in fact, next week's show is actually going to be with some of the clients that I've worked with that have had, I'm gonna say profound transformation and you'll hear it from them. When, when the activation begins, now I actually want to go back and just say something because what I really was trying to start with the show and we had some glitches because we had a, you know, last minute change with a guest um, and we just, you know, we're going with the flow here and we had some glitches with the clips being ready. Um, and I actually want to acknowledge my team, David Del Grosso, Ruben, um, Eugene, and Jameson and these guys are so awesome and so um, here we are live and I'm not and I don't want to actually change this and not do it live because eventually I'm gonna be having doing calls taking calls and tuning in and um, answering questions you know once we actually get the technology down a little bit little bit better but what I was intending to start the show off with and so I'm gonna just bring this full circle back is that there's chemicals, um, whether it's chemtrails or some of the different things that are being that are you know being put out there, that are affecting our brain chemistry and they're affecting the natural activation of the pineal and the pituitary. And I'm going to get into that more in another show. But what is important to be aware of is that once you start that and have that activation frequency um, activate the uh, alchemical transformation, life changes dramatically. Should you continue saying yes? And so that's what next, that is what ne next week's show is all about. Um, people because it's experiential it's hard to describe it's like trying to describe how it feels to ride a bike you really can only say so much until you actually get on the bike and you ride it and then Alan Steinfeld who is um, has new realities TV we're gonna talk about living in the fifth dimension and the emotional components um, of uh, walking through the shift so if I can leave you with anything uh, from today's show is that we have some work ahead of us and just as Frank's experience was very challenging that is potentially what we have ahead of us but I do believe that to get to any type of um, 
peace and a loving planet and being able to co-create with universal energies and living in the vibration and frequency of love and inner, that inner stillness and inner peace, not just words, but that beingness, it's worth it. And so it just is going to take us um, getting together and really having a clear vision and activating that reality into existence. And I know we can do it. So thank you so much for going with the flow today. And thank you for everything that you are being and doing on your journey, in your path. And even if you are in the, I don't know what I don't know. If you don't know what even some of the stuff I'm talking about is, it's, it's okay. Um, you, it's, it's all there for you, know, you to come back to as well. And so the most important thing is that you have the intention of being in a place of loving yourself and being willing and open to surrender and to be coachable and to be open to whatever is coming in for your highest and divine truth. And so there you have it. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Deborah Ariel Peach. This is Wake Up Shift is Happening. And I hope to see you next week. Bigdala, back to the normal position. So you start to get an idea of fear and survival. And we have a mass consciousness on the planet that is very, uh, very much in fear and survival. How do we get out of this? How We're at choice point. Humanity is a choice point. So how do we shift out of this? Well, the next clip that I'd like to share is um, with Bruce Lipton. Now, Bruce, I actually know from back in the uh, day when I was producing a radio show called The Aware Show, and that was like back in early 2000, 2000, 2001. And Bruce is a cellular biologist, and um, he was kind of almost an atheist uh, until he had kind of an awakening. And through cellular biology came into the awareness that everything is connected and that we create our reality. So this is a clip that he did as an interview and um there's we're only i'm just going to have a portion of it um shown the concept of a material universe ruled the world and in 1925 physicists finally had to accept the reality that it's not a universe based on matter it's actually a universe based on energy because the atoms are not made out of matter they're made out of energy so everything is made out of energy. So there you are in one day saying this is a material mechanical universe and the body is a machine and it's got chemistry in it. And then according to physics the next day, it said, well, that's an illusion. The body is actually energy and it's influenced by energy. And yet the physicists going from Newtonian physics to quantum physics, it wasn't an easy transition. I mean, if you made your whole career teaching a, of a material universe and one day wake up and say, you know, everything I taught for all those years, let's just forget that and start again. It wasn't easy. So there was a, it was a transition phase where the old thinking had to evolve, you know, leave the system and the new thinking coming in. Well, today's new biology is, is exactly the same, but it has a more profound difference for us in one sense because the, the old physics took us like from a, uh, uh, you know, a crank telephone to a cell phone, or, or, or from a steam engine to a rocket ship engine. Mm -hmm. That was the difference between Newtonian physics and quantum physics. And in biology, the new biology is going to take us from a world today uh, of crisis and ill health and, uh, and a failing, a failing uh, environment and world, and take us to another level uh, of masterful control where we, in our consciousness and our experiences of life, will actually have power over our own lives and not be the victims that we were programmed to be. So to me, when people understand the nature of this and recognize how their perceptions about life, which, which we'll talk about, about beliefs about life, when they change, it actually has a biological connection through the energy field, through quantum physics, and through a new thing called epigenetic control. Remember, genetic control controlled by genes. Epigenetic control is the new field of science. As a matter of fact, just within the last year or so, it's finally breaking into the public because it's been at the leading edge of science for about 20 years. But that science takes a long time before it can ultimately get to the public or mass attention. So they're just bringing it to the world, to the mass world. Epigenetic control and epi.
and welcome back to Wake Up, Shift is Happening. I am Deborah Ariel Peach, and sitting next to me is the charming and ever so amazing Frank Ferrante. And before we get into really what you're here to talk about, we're, we've had a little change of plans. In fact, um, this is live television, and so since uh, the first guest, Josh and Rebecca Tickell, that were going to come on the show, uh, Josh is actually very ill and has pushed himself all week and called about 45 minutes ago and said, I really can't do this. And so I are my, huddled up with my team and I was like, okay, well, and you got here and early and I thought, and I tuned in. And um, the guidance that I got was to actually talk and to, uh, at the, really what was in the highest divine good was for me to bring forth some information. So before I go into that information, I would like to acknowledge you and introduce you even more. Um, we met about two years ago this week mm. at the Topanga Film Festival. And it was uh, at your, I think it was one of your, the debut screenings of the film, mm -hmm. May I Be Frank. And it was it is incredibly powerful and life transformative and transforming. And so here you are now. And thank you for being here. You're welcome. Uh, a lot of life has occurred for you. And continues to do so. <laughs> day to day. Fortunately, you know, <laughs> I like to start my day on the right side of the grass. It's a, there's so, a lot of promise that way. You, exactly, exactly. So we're going to get into your whole story and what brought you into this transformational experience that is really revealing um, uh, through May I Be Frank. And then we're going to talk further about that. The guidance I got, though, is to actually start talking about some of the different things that um, I have been given information on. And, you know, you know that I uh, am, I kind of traverse between being multidimensional, you know, communicating in this dimension as well as, tra as traverse with communicating with non-physical beings of light and energy and get very detailed information for people and also as well as what's going on in the, on the planet, like in the macrocosm. So the guidance I got uh, half an hour, 45 minutes ago, was to actually talk about some of these things that I only just mentioned a little bit about in the first show that I did, which was last week, and it was with uh, people like Philip Collins and Foster and Kimberly Gamble and Mary Liz Murphy. So we're circling back after we've laid the foundation. And what I'd like to uh, start with is some of the things that I mentioned in that show I referred to this time on the planet. Now, the show, the title of the show today is Humanity is a Choice Point. And how do we go from breakdown to breakthrough? And so here we are as a, on the planet, in the macrocosm of the planet, we are pretty much in breakdown in a lot of areas, most areas in, um, in our lives as far as and the systems. The banking system, if you're following any of the behind the scenes that are now is finally coming out to the um, mainstream media. You know, they're starting to cover the LIBOR situation and the uh, oil industry. And Josh Tickell, who was going to be here, has just done a, a film called The Big Fix, which is uh, it talks about the um, uh, Gulf oil spill and that situation. And... The other things that um, really have not been working and serving the betterment of humankind and for the whole. And so I refer to this time, uh, so the guides that I work with, I will refer to many of them are Ascended Masters and the Angelic Realm. And I say work with because it, that's basically what it is. It's a strategic alliance that um, is telepathic communication. I get details. And Cobra I had on the show last week was somebody that I align very much with the information that he's bringing forth, which is why he came on in um, the show and we've had several conversations. So where are we right now? 
So here we are, mid-2012, we're moving into the end of the year for 2012, and I refer to this time that we've been experiencing, especially in the last 10 years, 11 years since 9-11, as the dissension reality as well as the deception reality. And I say this because the guidance that I have received is that in 2001, what was meant to occur in the game plan in the big blueprint was for us to really start an ascension journey where there was 12 timelines that were going to come together 12 dna strands activating 12 zodiac signs many things that were meant to um, in our awakening increasing in the vibration on the planet as well as our physical um, crystalline grid structure that's within our physical vessels to activate and to become higher vibration and much more love. And that by this time we were meant to be creating, many of us be creating modern day miracles. And we are not on that timeline. And so how do we create, how did, how did we get here? And the only reason I'm saying this is so we have some understanding in a way. Means, uh, that's a prefix, that means above. So when you say the word epidermis, uh, in biology, the, the skin, the epidermis, means the layer above the dermis. So epi means above, and you say epigenetic control, then that translates as control above the genes. And that is like the difference between either controlled by the genes or your control is above the genes. And, and when you're controlled by the genes, you're a victim of your genes. When you're controlled by a, something above your genes, then that controls your genes. And it turns out the mind is what's above the genes and it's the mind that controls the genes and when people in the world can own this not as well that's a neat idea but as a fact then it says well if you want to change your life and you want to express different characters or traits then it's incumbent upon you to know that your mind is involved with actually creating that ability that behavior that genetic expression that allows you to control what you want in your life so we go from victim to master in this new biology. Here we are, humanity's that choice point. And this is an individual inside job, which is what you are have been um, expressing for the last couple of years, as well as the macrocosm, the consciousness mm -hmm. of the collective uh, unified field. And so what I'm here to do is support people and having the awareness of what it takes, and I say to people, waking up is not for the mamsy pamsy. And this is some of the things that we're gonna share and show that you experienced in the uh, making of, may I be frank, and your transformation. It can be hard, hard as heck, right? Some of it is, some of it is hard and, and most of it is just different. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, and it also requires a willingness. It, it's 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 not something. There's no magic bullet. Right, exactly. Okay, so let's just you know what. Let's just. I'm gonna. We'll come back to the Bruce Lipton stuff and all of that later. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about how all this really started. Because in order for us to change and shift where we are as a collective consciousness, as humanity, it takes the kind of fortitude the courage, the commitment, the willingness that you have experienced. And um, it took uh, you stepping in and saying yes, basically. So let's go back to that. For people that haven't seen May I Be Frank, and we're gonna show some clips of the, of the film. If we can find if we those. Could, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so this all started when you were at a restaurant. Correct. Yes. I, I just, I just, may I just go back to something you said Absolutely. earlier? You mind? Uh, talking about the planetary shifts and all that. Yeah. And um, uh, the breakdown, of this, all these systems that are breaking down, that whole um, notion that too big to fail, which is absurd because it's actually too big to sustain. And and I think when I look at it from a a, a, meta, a, a metaphorical uh, standpoint. When you think of a wounded animal, mm -hmm. that's when they're most dangerous. And right. And the way the way I awareness of how we got here, so that we can move past 
the challenges and the issues that have gotten us here or that we have um, yeah, that have gotten us here and um, move into the timeline that exists that is, I believe, much more filled with love and abundance and the joy that we're meant to really be experiencing. And so um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I'd like to just show a clip of, so there's some things that I have been uh, told by my guides that uh, have really affected us right now not only because the powers that be that have had um, rather uh, controlling uh, agenda um, for money and for all sorts of um, different things, natural resources, etc., but also there has been some um, challenging um, aspects that have created some uh, challenges with our physical vessel, especially our brain. And so one of the things is... Um, when we, the chemicals, uh, as far as like chemtrails and the different things that, in the chemicals that are in our food and whatnot, actually are affecting our brain chemistry. And so um, if we could roll, I just want to show a couple of clips and then we're going to um, talk about this a little bit more. So right now, the, the clip that I'd like to show is about the uh, amygdala. And because we, since 9-11, there's been so much fear and survival that has been pumped out through the media and through the banking, that there's not enough money, that there's, you know, we, this war on terrorism, etc. With that fear and survival information that we are now uh, basically taking in, it's something that's in our brain chemistry that creates that reality then as well and it keeps us in the fight or flight. Okay, so if we can roll that clip, um, this is just a one minute, really quick little animated clip that gives some information about the fight or flight perspective. And this is also ties into your experience, Frank, um, of the transformation that you've, you've experienced, well, prior to the, the May I Be Frank experience. The amygdala is a pair of small organs in the brain each about the size of an almond. The amygdala acts like a thermostat, regulating, among other things, our normal baseline anxiety level. As anxiety levels rise in response to stressors such as bereavement, work stress, or money worries, for example, the amygdala's needle is pushed up to the high anxiety zone. Under normal circumstances, this needle returns to normal after the event. But when the stress or anxiety you experience is relentless, the needle gets stuck at the high anxiety position. It becomes instinctual. The subconscious mind which controls all the automatic bodily systems thinks that this new anxiety level is appropriate and normal, but you know consciously that it is not. It is as if the hard drive of your mind has been reprogrammed with new anxious software. With this new anxiety level come sensations and symptoms of anxiety disorder and maybe panic attacks, phobias, and disturbing thoughts. So in order to reverse these changes, you have to reset the needle of your 